Good morning. How are you today? I see a lot of people on here in Iraq. Good morning. How are we today? I'm an entertainer. I need that, that energy. Uh, once again, my name is Terrence Pipkins. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have a half hour. My challenge is to crunch as much information into a half hour as possible. So here we go. Born in a small steel mill town, 45 minutes south of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. There we go, got a clap. Um, yeah, uh, steel mill town, I remember as a child, everyone worked in the mill. You graduated from high school, you either worked in the mill, you went to the service. Uh, my grandmother had 10 children, six girls, four boys. My uncles went to the mill, went to the service, went on, lived life and left. Uh, me, oldest of four, single mother, you know, the stereotypical African-American story. Grew up in the housing projects. Uh, the mill shut down, crack moved in, gangs came in. Uh, if you were a young black male living in Pittsburgh between the years of, I'd say, 1989 through 92, you consider yourself a survival of the gang war. It got so bad, probably in like 1991, there was a summer where the city of Pittsburgh, probably 150, 200,000 people in the inner city limits, we had the same uh, shooting number as all five boroughs of New York in two days. So it was pretty violent. So lived through that. I just focused on my art, tried to stay out of the way, seen a lot of things happen that I probably shouldn't have seen, lost a lot of friends to violence, uh, went to a lot of funerals and wakes, uh, lost family members, close friends. Uh, let's see, visual artist. I've been drawing since early as I can remember with crayons, pencils, uh, always creative. All my friends, we didn't have much, so we created, you know, things out of little things that we had. Uh, like we had a, you know how the ice cream truck comes through the projects every day. I would get a popsicle. All my friends would collect all the popsicle sticks and we would sit on a curve and actually like scrape the popsicle sticks and make designs out of the popsicles, sharpen the front, put that into a straw, get a rubber band and make crossbows. <laughs> you know, little things like that. So I was the cool nerd guy because I was creative and draw, so I was kind of, and I was kind of a hybrid where I was good at sports. I wore glasses and I was really smart so I can jump, play with my nerdy friends and jump and play with the cool jocks because I had a big family. So I had a lot of cousins that take care of me as well. Um, got older, started cutting hair and I started putting those fancy designs, you know, like Big Daddy Kane and everything. <laughs> so that's how my, I got my name in high school actually. Uh, I had a chair, bought a cheap pair of clippers, like walls from a Walmart, and actually started cutting hair there, and that's how I got my name. Then the hair cutting turned to airbrushing. I used to use the airbrush in high school. Um, early 20s, I met a guy named Kamau Ware. He was the founder of the Bridge Spotters Collective, which is a young artist collective. We had poets, artists, uh, painters, anything you could think of and I was a live performance painter and a poet and a MC. It all come together. If I'm all over the place, that's because I am. So, <laughs> so I you know, jump started my rap career in high school. I had a friend, we started a group. Um, you know, created a little name for myself, kind of pulled away from rap and that's when the spoken word era came in. You know, movie Love Jones and everything, where it went commercial, so I started actually was rapping a cappella because my, my lyrical content was deep enough where I could just speak, you know, speak to people without the music because I'm, you know, political activist, whatever. So that happened and with the Artist Collective, we get a, we actually acquired a, uh, a art gallery in downtown Pittsburgh and I was hosting open mics with Poetry Night so I was uh, making these wire sculptures at the time. I used to call it 3D scribble, because I'd take wire, I would make a shape, and I would wind it until it turned into figures. So that turned into, hmm, there's still sculptures. What if I make one move? Decided to turn one into a puppet. 
So it was a really crude, abstract wire puppet. So I just put clothes on it, you know, and made it move around. It was interesting. So a downstairs neighbor of mine uh, lived in these showroom lofts at the time. It was an old Studebaker dealership, and they converted into lofts up in Pittsburgh on Penn Avenue in the Garfield area. So he's like, oh man, you made a puppet, you have to see this movie. So he ran downstairs, came back upstairs with a VHS tape, yes, a VHS, of the movie Being John Malkovich. I popped it in, watched it, and if you know the story, it's the story of a puppeteer. And the opening scene, he had a marionette in the room. He made the marionette run and do a forward roll and jump up. And I said, I have to do that. <laughs> so that sparked something. Uh, the movie went off and said, wow, I'm a puppeteer. So I used the puppet. I built a little set for it. And I started hosting the open mic poetry nights with the puppet. <laughs> Turned out being awesome. So his name was Dobie Livewire. He, I call him my Adam because he's my first creation. So in 05, uprooted uh, my wife and my two-year-old at the time, we moved to Carborough, North Carolina. That's when I started actually, you know, taking the puppet thing seriously. So I actually uh, made four uh, marionettes out of wood and I named them Strings Attached. They were a punk rock group. It's awesome, there's a video online, it's called we, Are, we All Puppets. A neighbor of mine at the time, he was a producer, so he hooked up the music, he got some musicians together, we put together a song, and we shot the video and put it on YouTube. And that was my first uh, experience with the music video. Fast forward, I was working at a, uh, a restaurant called The Spotted Dog in Carborough as a server, and the owner seen you know, my puppets and my artwork. And she was like, you know, you should set up out front. You know, you got some pretty cool stuff. So I started setting up in the street and I would build a puppet and I would bring it out in the public. And basically I was just practicing and rehearsing on the street, started acquiring a crowd. I'm like, wow, this is cool. You know, getting tits and performing. And it got to the point where I had so many people in front of the restaurant that people couldn't get in out of the restaurant. I'm like, could y'all make room, you know, for the, for the client, the customers. So that started taking off, you know, the buzz started. And that's when I met Donovan Zimmerman of Paper Hand Puppet Intervention. I was working at the art center at the time, matter of fact. So he came in, you know, introduced us, say, would you want to do a puppet show? I said, of course, you know, because I've heard about Paper Hand and I was trying to see how I can get in anyway. So it was perfect. We uh, did a show called Hungry Ghost, which was pretty awesome. Uh, uh, the, a puppeteer named Tori Ralston, she wrote the show and her and Donovan collaborated and I built puppets for this show. So that was my first experience with puppet theater, which is uh, pretty awesome. Uh, long story short, fast forward, did uh, three or four shows on and off with him, still doing the uh, street performance thing. and. I'm going to skip straight to the video. All right. So a year, year and a half ago, like I said, I was a rapper back in Pittsburgh. I'm on Facebook and a guy named, he goes by Iza Kizza now. He signed with a Timberland, you know, Missy Elliott's um, partner. So he contacts me on Facebook, was like, dude, call me. This is lucrative. So I haven't heard it from him in like 15 years. So I said, what's going on? He's like, yada, yada, I'm signed cool with Missy Elliott. She wants puppets for her next video. I said, are you kidding me? So, you know, he hooks me up. He calls on a three way and as I'm talking to Missy while I'm at work at Just Right Academy. So I'm out in the schoolyard like, oh my God, because I'm a teacher at a, a private school for kids with special needs. So I'm walking around the playground I'm like, hey, stop that. Put that down. Anyway, Missy, you know. <laughs> So back to the job, like I said, I'm all over the place, bear with me. I'm at uh, Just Right Academy, uh, special needs. We uh, do everything, behavioral, anxiety, uh, what is that word, autism, was a big thing. So we teach social skills. I took a social skills curriculum. Her name is uh, Michelle Garcia Winter. And she, you know, she does presentations. So uh, our school bought her curriculum and we go off of her books and textbooks. So I built a puppet 
to teach a social skills class with named Mr. Skills. <laughs> He's awesome. So um, at first, you know, I was, we have a circle, you know, we teach interactions and how to read faces and whatnot, you know, challenges for uh, children with autism. So one day, I'm a teacher's assistant is my, you know, formal title in our primary class, K through second grade, is, you know, we have the head teacher and I'm kind of, you know, have her back and you know, support her. So we had a couple of children, you know, everyone has bad days. So they decided, you know, we're not going to do our work today. So I, you know, put my head together with my coworker, say, well, how are we going to, you know, get them to do their work? I said, I know, I'll get Mr. Skills. I pull out the puppet. So Skills walks up, hey, you know, I heard you, you're not doing your work, you know. You mind, you mind finishing that worksheet for me? Sure, Skills. So they finish the worksheet, you know, he checks the work for them. It's like, wow, so he's a motivator. So I started bringing, you know, more puppets and I was, uh, you know, something to work towards. You know, if you finish your work on time, you get to play with the puppet during recess. So, you know, it worked out. So back to the Missy Elliott thing. <laughs> Speak to her on the phone. And this was right before, it was a few months before she went on stage with Carrie, uh, Katy Perry at the Super Bowl. I was almost there, folks. <laughs> it was heartbreaking. I watched that Super Bowl. I don't watch sports. So I actually watched the Super Bowl holding back tears, knowing that I could have been there in Miami. But, you know, we hooked up a little bit too late. They do background checks and, you know, we dropped the ball. But she said, I'm still going to work with you. So fast forward six months, a year. She told her production company that she wanted puppets in her video. But, you know, she didn't tell them about me. I had built a puppet for her that ended up not being used in the video. But the production team hit the ground running, you know, they wanted to impress her. So they went to a company called uh, Furry Puppet Studios and they built the puppets that are in the Missy Elliott video and in the Alec Baldwin commercial, which I'll talk about that too. So that happens. I get a phone call, you know, to say, you know, we need you to come to LA. So I go out, I see the puppets, I work with them. She, they, she wants them to twerk and do all this crazy stuff, but they're, kind of stiff and they don't move like she wants them to. So I stepped there, I was like, look, Missy, I actually have to redo them, take them apart and rebuild them. She's like, what? I said, yes, and we had 10 days for the, for the shoot. So her production company is called Hi-Hat Productions. Uh, Chris Ruffin, the uh, founder, and his wife's name is Hi-Hat, and she's one of the biggest uh, choreographers in Hollywood. She actually flew from South America on a tour with Rihanna to come back and choreograph the video for Missy. So I'm there, we set up equipment and they went and got me all my supplies and I'm in her dance studio with a table and a, uh, a wardrobe rack with the marionettes hanging on there and we're just taking the puppets apart and rebuilding them. I'll go to her and say, well, what do you want this one to do? I'm working on it at night and I take it to her the next day, demo she goes, okay. So that was all fine and good. Um, actually met Pharrell Williams as well because, you know, he's, he actually made the beat and he's in the uh, video, but I'm actually controlling the Pharrell puppet in the video. So I'm Pharrell, <laughs> which is awesome. Uh, we went to the studio. He was there, the most humble guy probably in Hollywood. He uh, actually walked up to us, you know, thank you so much. It's an honor to work with you. I'm like, dude, stop, you're Pharrell Williams. <laughs> I'm supposed to be saying this to you. So we hang out for a half hour. You know, he meets his puppet. He's freaked out because it's a miniature puppet of him. So we meet him. You know, he leaves. The video happens. Uh, she shot it at night. So it was actually a two night shoot from 6 p.m. to 6 in the morning. I thought it was, you know, just shoot until we're done. He was like, no, you don't understand. We are going to be here from 6 in the evening to 6 in the morning. But they had tents set up. The catering was amazing. They walk around with trays. Uh, the operation was just amazing. It was probably between 100 and 200 people actually in the video. So to see the process of all the shooting and taking, and it was just amazing. I was just taking notes like, wow, I'm blown away. Get back home to you know, my school. And I realized, like, that was fun and awesome, you know, Hollywood, this and that, but it wasn't fulfilling. 
I've noticed the energy out there is always what's next, what's next, what's next, what's next. When, when I get home, I'm calm. I have my fans, which are my students. Uh, some of them have been at the school for the six years it's been open. I'll tell you how I got to the school. I was doing a, a puppet workshop in Pittsburgh at a Clapping Hands Farm. It was a week-long puppet workshop. I built uh, puppets out of cardboard with the campers during the week, and that Friday, we did a show for the parents. So the director of Just Right Academy was uh, there, and she was opening her school that fall. So she seen me work with the kids. Her daughter was a camp counselor up under me. So she said, hi, you know, my name is Linda McDonough. I'm opening a school. Would you like to teach there? So I'm like, whoa. This is weird. <laughs> you know? So I've, I've, I haven't had any you know, training. She said, you know what? You're passionate about the children. I see your interaction. Just bring that energy to the school, and I'll teach you how to teach. So I said, OK, I can, I can give you, you know, a part-time position right now, because actually running a group home with my wife through a youth quest. So that actually led me, gave me the training to work with children with special needs, because it was a level three facility. So if you know the tier system, like level one foster care is just, you know, children, atypical, they're just displaced. Level two, there's some issues. Level three is you mess up again, you're getting locked up. <laughs> you know, so we had the level three students. I mean, uh, clients, we had full staff, but the state um, decided that they, no, the Fed decided that they were gonna have the state control the money. So now the state of North Carolina controls the funds for foster care and everything went downhill, the foster home closed. So we went into uh, being foster parents in our residence and we uh, actually phased out of that once we had our third child. So six years ago, when we opened the school Just Right Academy with uh, Linda McDonough, director, Marion Hauser is the assistant director now, it was just myself, Linda, and Marion. There was three teachers, I had no idea what I was doing, and nine students and actually had a student, he was a challenge. He was, oh man, he was a trip. You know, uh, stereotypical autism, you know, just no filter. One day, um, you know, running around the classroom like, ah, trying to keep my cool. And he looked at me, he said, you have no idea what you're doing. <laughs> and I looked at him, I said, you know what? You are right. <laughs> but we're gonna learn this together and we're gonna do this. You know, I just keep it honest with him. We can't because, you know, he see straight through the lies. So it was a few months later, we were walking, you know, on a, on our, on our playground, and he looked, they call me Mr. P at the school. So he looked at me, he said, you know what, Mr. P? You're a good teacher. Aww. And he walked away, I said, I know that was so hard for him to do. <laughs> and that was the best compliment that I've ever had. So I was like, you know what, I think I know what I'm doing here. So six years later, staff of 20, teachers and TAs, and we have 60 students now. Thank you. <laughs> so, back to the Missy video, that happened. Everything is rah, 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 come home. You know, at school, all my students are like, ah, oh, Mr. P, you're in Hollywood, please don't leave. I was like, I'll, I'll try not to go. So we got another call, and um, actually went in, uh, on stage with Missy and Pharrell, at the grand finale of The Voice, which was super cool. I was on the set. It's just ridiculous. I don't watch television, so it was funny. <laughs> the TV producer who produces the video, he's also a producer on The Voice. And he has an office probably four blocks from Universal Studios on Ventura Boulevard, a whole second floor suite. So I'm meeting all these TV producers, and I'm like, yeah, you know, how you doing? So he's looking like, dude, this is so-and-so from so-and-so. I'm like, eh. You know, so he pulls out tickets, you know, to, uh, what's the LA Clippers basketball? So he pulls that out. I'm like, eh. So he's like, dude, what, how can I impress you? Like, you don't care about celebrities, you don't watch sports, you know? So he actually appreciated that, and we got really close, because he was actually a retired barber, and that's how he met Missy Elliott, so we have a connection there. So, yeah, this is my work. I use all recycled materials. This is Anansi, my spider. 
uh, recycle scrap wood in the movement. There are uh, four or five different families of puppets. If you're not familiar, they're like hand puppets, rod puppets, marionettes. I try to merge different styles of puppetry together. And I was like, this is really a challenge. I don't know how hard it is to make eight legs move at the same time, but it's really hard. I started out as a marionette. I probably built this probably three or four times so I got it to this level. So basically it's a, a rod puppet merged with a marionette. I like to call them hybrids. I'm trying to think of a cool name to a trademark like Jim Henson and the Muppets. Because <laughs> Muppets are basically uh, hand, hand and rod puppets merged together. So this is a hand and marionette. This guy right here I'm Jigetto and he is Spinocchio because <laughs> he spins. I actually wrote a uh, stage show for him with a friend of mine named Pierce Freeland who actually run a teen center now with, we have um, spots in Durham and Chapel Hill. I run the Chapel Hill one, it's called Black Space. We're on social media, Instagram, Facebook. We are a teen center and we are activism through Afrofuturism. This show is the Pinocchio story told in the distant future about an android who wants to be a real b-boy. <laughs> and we, uh, you know, we uh, confront political issues, especially you know, police brutality in the show. So I'll give you a little demo of what he does. He's made of all PVC plumbing pipe, and he's all put together with fishing line. He does, he does pretty cool things, he moves around. <laughs> so yeah, that's him. He's actually in the show as well. And while I'm showing you this, I'm actually in the summer show this year of Paper Hand Puppet Intervention as well. We are at the Forest Theater in Chapel Hill on UNC's campus right now for the next two weeks, and we will be here in Raleigh. If you look up paperhand.org, the schedule is on their website. <laughs> Who laughed? <laughs> And I heard someone say Beast. This is one of my more popular puppets. I hope I don't mess up this mic putting them on. Hold on, give me a second. Let's see. When I, uh, is my mic still on? Okay. When I build puppets, I, I don't uh, design anything, there's no blueprint, I don't sketch anything, I just grab the pieces and just go right in. That's my method with all my art. Even when I uh, do paintings, I'm a painter as well. There's no sketching involved, I just jump right in and put shapes, shading, and then I come in with the detail afterwards. That's the same way I do my puppetry. But as you can see, of recycled materials, of uh, wood, PVC body. And this is actually a pair of my son's khakis. <laughs> <laughs> so I think he's a merge between a bird, a monkey, and a sloth. So he's considered a hand puppet, I guess. He's the biggest weirdo. <laughs> All right. What did your son think of his khakis? <laughs> oh, he used some of it to make his own puppets. My eight-year-old is actually in the paper hand show with me. So he's an amazing young kid. He's into puppets. 
I'm in, trying to get into this wearable puppet thing. I'm expanding. My craft, this is a mask that I've, I'm working on. It's a wire frame. It's covered with a cardboard and just cloth. This is an old t-shirt. Let me see if I can. So yeah, wearable puppets. Yeah. <laughs> actually built a pair of uh, goat legs for the uh, Paper Hand Show. I'm actually uh, if you're familiar with the um, the first novel written uh, of King Gilgamesh. I am his character Inky Do, half man, half beast. So I built this pair of goat legs and I built this mask for it. I um, actually have a few other puppets that actually have sound effects. So I'm gonna to see which one I wanna do first. Probably do the T-Rex. Let's see. All right, here we go. All right, you ready for that T-Rex sound? Here we go. This all scrap wood. Her name is Dinah, by the way. I can do that all day. <laughs> Dinah the Dinosaur, <laughs> thank you. This next piece, I'm gonna do a young, small performance for you with, this is the cellist. I keep the name simple. You know, if I make a dog puppy, I'll be, his name is Dog. You know, <laughs> the cat puppy, his name is Cat. I do have a lion puppy name is Lionel. I added the oh. E-L to the end. Let me see me. Uh, Find the cello suite. All right. All right. There we go.
Thank you. Uh, John, want to open for questions? All right. Q and A. Let's do it. Any first takers going once, going twice. Yes. Where do you get the ideas for all of these different puppets? They all seem very unique to me. I've never seen a cellist puppet before. Where do you come up with that? The way I came up with the cellist puppet, I have a really good friend who's a classically trained cellist at a CMU. Uh, his, uh, his professor gave him a 100-year-old cello as a graduation gift, so he really rocks. And I said, well, how can I play cello and not practice for 20 years? <laughs> I know, I'll build a puppet. <laughs> but yeah, just life inspiration, experiences, uh, different ideas just come from different things. I see something that hasn't been done, I say, well, if, if I can make my puppet do that, and I, I basically, I think of a challenge and just, you know, make that challenge. Like spiders are my fav one of my favorite animals or insects, whatever they're called, arachnids. So I was like, I'm going to make a spider. So I try to find something that's never been done before and I do it, basically. Yes? It uh, sounded like from your story with Mr. Skills that mm -hmm. sometimes you can get uh, thought across better to children with a puppet than you can in person. Have you found that? Yes, very much so. Uh, I did a, a show years ago with some UNC uh, drama students called the Shadow Box. So I built, it was probably like eight puppets. It was a story about a hospice written in the 70s, a screenplay. And I was, I built the puppets. We put the clothes and the hair and the hats on them. And the director was like, wait, let's leave the faces blank. Let's not put faces on them. So we were just, you know, plain white PVC. At the end of the show, people were walking up like, how did you get that puppet to smile? How did you get that puppet to cry? So the adults were actually projecting the emotions they were feeling onto the puppets, which was mind blowing to me. And it kind of works with, um, especially children with um, autism, some they can't uh, read face, you know, emotions and faces, but you remove the human aspect, and I don't know what it is. I was just trying to explain it to someone yesterday. I would just call it magic. Because I'm, I'm not a psychologist, so I don't know how the brain works, but basically it's like the magic of puppetry. They really relate to them. Anyone else? Yes? They, they start developing their personality probably when they're probably like 75, 80% done. Where I'll, you know, I have to drill a hole in their head or something. Like, I'm sorry. Like, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, I was working, I actually built a Amy Winehouse puppet. That's pretty awesome. I wish I had time. But I was working on her last night in my studio. And I pulled out the X-Acto knife because I had to rebuild her mouth. So I actually like cut her head off. I'm like, this is weird. I'm sorry, Amy. Ah, couldn't even look. <laughs> but I beheaded Amy Winehouse. <laughs> it was horrible. But now she works a lot better. Her head's back on. <laughs> All right, anyone else? Any? Yes. Thank you. I embraced my weirdness as a young child. Yes, I did. I own it. Yes, I mean, even as that I work at the school now, you know, a lot of teachers try to force relationships on the kids, and I'm totally against that because I could care less if I had any friends. 
I'm going to have fun anyway. So I would ask kids, do you want to go to a playground? If not, oh well, I'm there by myself playing in the dirt, you know, entertaining myself. So as, as far as socially, you know, I know always known a lot of people. I was always that local celebrity, but friends, whatever. I'm happy with or with or without. You know? I'm that weirdo. Yeah. <laughs> so I embraced it and yeah, when people say, oh, that's weird or that's creepy, you know, they'll see a puppet, I'll be like, thank you. And they look at me like, no, a, a creepy puppet to me is very, a big compliment because if someone reacts to it and they're pulling back, that means it's realistic and I've, I've done my job. Even with the, uh, the T-Rex puppet, I actually have a lot of funny interactions with dogs. And they growl and they like sometimes I'll start to fight and there's actually a few dogs that'll come and sniff the butt to see if it's alive, trying to get a scent. <laughs> so I think I nailed the movement pretty much. <laughs> right. uh, it was one more hand up further back. Yes. I know you. <laughs> you need to talk. <laughs> That was an interesting interaction with the, uh, the choreographer. She had these big ideas <laughs> that were not possible with marionettes. So, you know, we met her. She's like, okay, I want that one to do the running man. <laughs> you know, I want this one to do I was like, hold on. These are suspended from strings. I was like, if you wanted to do that, we can, but we have to go to a studio, get green screen, I have to turn them into rod puppets. I mean, we can do it, but it'll be a whole different thing. We can't do it outside. I was like, this is what they can do. So we kind of negotiated the movement and you know, she was pretty happy once. She knew her limits and then we revisited the choreography from there. So it was like a back and forth thing because you know, people weren't familiar with puppets and how they move, so yeah. That's awesome. One more Melissa? Yeah. Uh, so what is your next dream thing to go to? I mean, you've been in Hollywood, you've touched so many children. Um, in, in the world of puppetry, what, is, what would be your, your big accomplishment? My big accomplishment is to open a kid's puppet theater. Well, a puppet theater, but I want children to come and learn writing scripts, building puppets, manipulating puppets, uh, filming, editing, scores, everything. That's Because I want to do everything in one building where they can just come in and just create, you know, and get away from whatever they're trying to get away from, have a different venue to, you know, express themselves artistically is my main goal, because it's I always come back to the children. That's what, you know, it's, it's a, that's just what I am. That's what I guess of my calling to work with children. Oh, thank you. Definitely. Just contact me. Don't feel free to follow me. I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram. So yeah, YouTube.